And our opening slide welcomes you to the space in the Washington Bike Walk Roll Summit 2020 presented by Amazon. I'm Barb, Active Transportation Director, Active Transportation Division Director for WashDOT, and my pronouns are she, her. I am coming to you currently from South Seattle on Duwamish land. Welcome, and we're so excited that over 600 people registered for this event over the five days. We want to start with a land acknowledgement. As a virtual summit, those of you participating are joining us from many lands. We acknowledge that Cascade Bicycle Club today sits on the traditional home of the Duwamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and Suquamish tribal nations. If you don't know whose lands you're on, we will drop a link in the chat in a minute and you can find a link to a map that you could use to look up your place on the land. Without those original inhabitants, we would not have access to this environment, and we take the opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. We'd also like to note that we are recording this session and it will be av available following the summit. The summit is hosted by Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes, two sister statewide organizations with a shared vision of bicycling for all. Cascade serves bike riders of all ages and abilities throughout Washington State, educating new riders, advocating for safe places to ride, and holding events and rides. Washington Bikes advocates for bicyclists' rights, endorses political candidates, holds officials accountable, and works to shape policies that will make bicycling safe and accessible for all. We want to take a moment to thank our sponsors whose collective contributions have enabled us to bring together 15 panels with extra expert speakers from across the country and registration free for all attendees. Thanks to Amazon, our presenting sponsor. We also thank our supporting sponsors, the Washington State Department of Transportation and Active Transportation Division and Eastern Region, and thanks also to our general sponsors, U.S. Department of Transportation, Federal Highways Administration, and Stacey Bain Bike Lawyers. With that, and before we transition to introducing the summit session, we want to take a minute to articulate the community expectations we have for all of the summit sessions. We will maintain a standard of conduct to ensure that all participants feel safe and respected. We believe every person has the right to be treated with dignity and respect and to be free from all forms of harassment. We ask you to be fully present in this session, be self-responsible and self-challenging, listen and process and listen and process, Suspend judgment of yourself and others. Use respectful language towards each other and to the, towards our panelists. I'll now quickly introduce, very briefly introduce, the session and our panelists, and then they will introduce themselves with a little more information on their roles and responsibilities in their organizations. We have with us today Peter Yoon from the Federal Highway Administration Resource Center and my colleague Larry Watkinson from WashDOT, Washington State Department of Transportation. And this session helps you understand that pedestrian fatalities in Washington State increased by 53% from 2009 to 2018, while all other traffic deaths only increased by 2%. Did you know that marked crosswalks alone, without other measures designed to reduce traffic speeds, shorten crossing distances, enhance driver awareness of the crossing, or provide active warning of pedestrian presence, should not be installed across certain types of roadways? Did you know there are seven spectacular treatments that help, can help improve the safety of people who walk across roadways? And did you know this, this session will provide you with a great tool to help you pick the right treatment? If you answered no to any of these sessions, that's those questions, that's why you're here. And our format is that Peter will be sharing the technical information. Larry will share with you the perspective for, for his perspective, both as a blind pedestrian and as our um, Americans with Disabilities Act specialist, to think about how those treatments work for everybody who needs to cross that street. So with that, I'm going to tell you our format. We're going to finish our introductions here. We'll go to the presentation. And um, you will hear Peter describe his slides in a way that is not always typical in a, in a presentation. And that's so Larry has full information to participate and to respond to what Peter is showing us. With the question and answers, what we ask you to do is to ask your chat question directly to me. When you go to where you can enter a chat, a question into the chat, you can select a panelist to send it to. If you directed it to me, this is an accessibility measure. If you direct it to everybody, what happens to Larry is it's being read into his ear the whole time, where he's also trying to listen to Peter present and be ready for his things he's going to add. So just an accessibility tip for you to think about. And at the end, you'll get a link in the chat bar with a feedback form to respond to this session. With that, I'll ask Peter to introduce himself briefly, um, let Larry know when it's his turn to introduce himself, and then Peter will start his slides. Thank you, Barb, and thank you, uh, 
to the Cascade uh, Bike Club. Um, this is the first time I've done a session like this uh, specifically focused on uh, with regards to ADA. And so I also want to thank Larry for joining me because I think I'm going to learn a few things uh, as well during this presentation. Uh, as, as I was putting this together, there was a lot more to think about than uh, what I normally do in a, a live uh, session. I am with the Resource Center of Federal Highways and I am a co-lead for the STEP initiative, which stands for Safe Transportation for Every Pedestrian. Uh, it's one of our Everyday Counts initiative. And so hopefully we can make this day count for you the next hour and uh, 15 minutes or so uh, that you can walk away here with something that you can implement to help save lives. I'm going to start out with a question. Two pedestrians with 20-20 vision walked into a bar. What did the blind pedestrian do? Ducked. Okay. Uh, fortunately, uh, or unfortunately, I can't see different faces. I did see a smile out of uh, Larry, so I think that joke actually did work. Um, but he ordered uh, a beer. <laughs> hopefully, you got that uh, uh, joke. Uh, but uh, on a little more serious note, I do like to start out with and then have some fun uh, in my presentations. But on a more serious note, as Barb mentioned in the introduction, in 2009 to 2018, the number of pedestrian fatalities has increased by 53%, while all other modes only 2%. And that in 2018, that did represent 70% uh, of uh, all the fatalities on our roadways. Uh, so the number of, uh, in 2018, um, and just so that we don't get confused with numbers and think, oh, that's just data, 6,283 lives were killed. And actually more than that were impacted. So 6,283 lives gone, but then the family members, coworkers, others are impacted by that. So let's never forget that this is, uh, we're talking about people, um, people that we know, people that we love. Now, going down into the data a little more, uh, about 72% of pedestrian fatalities occur at non-intersection locations. And that means mid-block crossings. Um, I can't see people's hands, so I I'm going to just virtually visualize that when I ask this question, um, how many of you guys have ever crossed mid-block, you know, away from an intersection? I suspect a lot of hands are going up, okay? But, uh, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, roughly 27% of pedestrian fatalities occur at intersections. Okay, and there's controlled intersections and uncontrolled intersections. Control being signalized or stop signs uncontrolled without. Um, about 16 to 17% of the fatalities occur at uncontrolled intersections. And that's gonna also be somewhat of a focus. But that's some of the data and that's why we have developed STEP. Because although we do have fatalities of people walking along the road, the majority of fatalities happen when people are crossing the roadway. And that's uh, Federal Highways focus. Just uh, before I get into some of the, the spectacular seven and some of the treatments, I do want to cover with regards to Washington State, uh, the RCW 46.61.235, which is with regards to the crosswalk laws. I pulled out a couple sections here that's uh, relevant to our conversation. The operator of an approaching vehicle shall stop and remain stopped to allow a pedestrian, bicycle, or personal delivery device to cross the roadway within an unmarked or mark crosswalk when the pedestrian bicycle or personal delivery device is upon or within one lane of, of the half of the roadway upon which the vehicle is traveling or unto which it is turning. So the key point there is that the vehicles in a crosswalk or at a unmarked crosswalk at an intersection, and we'll talk a little more about that here <laughs> shortly, vehicles are to stop for pedestrians. By law, they're supposed to stop for pedestrians at these locations marked crosswalks uh, or unmarked crosswalks uh, even at intersections. Uh, paragraph two, no pedestrian bicycle or personal delivery device shall suddenly leave a curb or other place of safety and walk, run, or otherwise move into the path of a vehicle which is so close that it's impossible for the driver to stop. Very good advice, good law. Don't just jump out in front of a car going 45 miles per hour when it's five feet away. So you do have, there is some responsibility upon the pedestrians not to jump out in front of a car when the car physically just can't stop in time for you. Paragraph four, whenever any vehicle is stopped at a marked crosswalk or any unmarked crosswalk at an intersection to permit a pedestrian, bicycle, or personal delivery device to cross the roadway, the driver of any other vehicle approaching from the rear shall not overtake and pass such stop vehicle. Okay, so vehicle stop, we call this a multi-threat situation. And I'll describe that a little more, but that law is there so that the vehicles aren't going around or passing a stop vehicle and having a multi-threat 
um, threat situation. Now let's get into uh, other outside of the crosswalk. This is the law. Uh, I don't know if everyone's heard of the term jaywalking. Uh, is it illegal? Um, you know, it depends. But in paragraph one of RCW 46.61.240, crossing at every pedestrian or personal delivery device crossing a roadway at any point other than within a marked crosswalk or within an unmarked crosswalk at an intersection shall yield the right of way to all vehicles upon the roadway. So that's basically saying, yes, pedestrians can cross mid block, even if there aren't, if, even if there isn't a marked crosswalk there, the only thing is that the pedestrian has to yield to the vehicle, not the other way around. So, we still can cross. So if you ever got a ticket uh, for jaywalking, look around you because uh, it, you may be able to get out of that ticket. Uh, but more importantly, it's, uh, it's something that we should, uh, in the STEP program, we're trying to uh, make things safer and this will come into play uh, a little later on. Paragraph two, where ramps exist uh, at, or, at or adjacent to intersections or at marked crosswalks in other locations. Persons with disabilities or personal delivery devices may enter the roadway from the curb ramps and cross the roadway within or as closely as practical to the crosswalk. Now, this is something new that I haven't seen uh, in a lot of other states, or it's the first time I've seen this in Washington state, and it's not uh, in other state laws. And Larry, I don't know if you want to make a comment with regard to this, because most of the times when someone's crossing a crosswalk, they're supposed to be in the crosswalk but this actually says as closely as practical to the crosswalk. Do you want to comment as to why they might have put that uh, language in there? Actually, I can. Hi, and I'll introduce myself very quickly as you group here. I'm Larry Watkins, and I'm with the Washington State Department of Transportation, as Barb mentioned, a colleague. Um, Barb and I are both relatively newcomers to the Department of Transportation, and in my official role, I am responsible for all of the ADA compliance statewide um, on behalf of the Department of Transportation, including the Washington State Ferries. Barb and I have an alignment, um, and she, she and I become strong business partners because active transportation and the role I have with protecting our pedestrians is a very essential function of the department as it relates to uh, issues we're going to be talking about today. To the specifics of the crossings, um, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to disclose it because I think you've maybe figured out um, I join you today as a blind person. I am visually impaired. I have had a vision impairment all of my life. At one time, I actually could ride a bicycle. Um, I've also, from an ADA perspective, um, in my life have been in a wheelchair for nearly a year and recovered from an illness called Guillain-Barre, which is unrelated to my sight impairment, but it was a form of paralysis to where I was on a respirator for nearly four months and had to learn how to use all of those functions again. So when it comes to the ADA, um, I have a lot of personal experience, both physically um, and with my sight impairment. But when I speak to the experiences of a blind person, I speak to my experience as a blind person because I have not experienced that of other blind uh, individuals. And so when I give you a perspective of, uh, of that experience, understand it's from the mouth of me and what I have experienced and there are different elements about other experiences individuals with sight impairments um, have um, in terms of uh, what they do in life. Specifically to the crossings, um, Peter, a, unless a sidewalk has tactile guidance, and that could be raised surface, um, not all crossings are aligned directionally across from each other, somewhere at an angle. You'll find where there are curb ramps that kind of were on the corner as opposed to from one uh, section to another section. So what that law does is ensures that a person who is identifies himself, for instance, using a white cane, and incidentally it's white cane month um, nationally, um, that extends to us the ability to cross that crossing and to be considered a legal crossing um, under this law. And mainly it's because we have not had all crossings fully aligned to where a person could pass it in a straight path. Um, I can answer any questions for you, Peter, um, but I think that summarizes it, why the no, law exists the way it does. 
Yeah, no, that's great. Um, that's very helpful. And I think it'll come, uh, they'll come back into relevance uh, when we go into some of these slides. And I apologize for, for getting to allow you to introduce yourself. So thank you. I'm for fine that. with that. <laughs> I just, uh, yeah, just uh, so let's move on because I do have a lot of uh, material um, to cover. So, oh, actually, so paragraph three. Uh, any pedestrian crossing a roadway at a point where a pedestrian tunnel or overhead pedestrian crossing has been provided shall yield the right of way to all vehicles upon the roadway. And, uh, and this also, uh, whether it is ADA uh, compliant with regards to the ramps or not, um, sometimes people may not be able to use uh, the overpasses or uh, tunnels. Um, sometimes tunnels are very actually scary. And so you do have the ability to cross that grade. It's just that if there isn't a marked crosswalk at a mid-block location there, pedestrians, once again, can cross that grade, uh, but they have to yield to the vehicles. So, and then this fourth paragraph says, between adjacent intersections at which traffic control signals are in operations, pedestrians shall not cross at any place except in a marked crosswalk. Now, it does not say with regards to the adjacent intersections how close or how far away that they have to be. Um, so that's actually somewhat problematic in some sense. So to help understand with regards to the, the law, the codes, um, I've got a image here, aerial image of an arterial. Um, we've got uh, three uh, four-legged intersections uh, labeled one, two, and three. They're signalized uh, between signals one and two, which is about a half mile apart, we'll say. There is a T intersection in between. And then between signals two and three, there is no uh, roadways in there, so they are adjacent. Now I've got a line here uh, at A, which is just, uh, it's a mid-block crossing. It's not at the T intersection. And I was, um, if I would have been able to see people's hands, uh, I would ask the question, you know, can somebody cross at uh, A legally? And I would hope that uh, I can't see the chat. So I'm gonna say, yes, you actually can cross at A legally. It's just that the pedestrian has to yield to the driver at that point. Now, at the T intersection, which there aren't marked crosswalks, there a driver would have to yield to the pedestrian. And I've got the next image will show a little more about that. But between signals two and three, which is more about a mile apart, double the distance of one and two, these are adjacent. Um, can someone legally cross at B, which is about midpoint? And the answer is no. According to the law, they can't cross at that point. And so you're requiring by law pedestrians to walk a half a mile down the road to a signal and then walk half a mile back uh, just to get across the road. So uh, and a lot of people probably won't do that. And therefore, um, we have the issue of, uh, you know, people getting uh, seriously injured or uh, fatalities uh, crossing these type of roadways. Uh, the right of way, here's an, another image with we've got Main Street. It's a four lane with a two way left turn lane um, at the T uh, at the uh, four legged intersection uh, at point A. We have high visibility marked crosswalks across Main Street. Who has the right of way? The pedestrian has the right of way at A, where the vehicle has to yield by law to the pedestrian. And then at, mid, at the midpoint, there's a mid block crossing at B. Once again, the pedestrians can cross there. It's just that they have to yield to the vehicles. But at C, which is uh, the T intersection, and then it's an unmarked uh, T intersection, uh, this is where it confuses a lot of people. You have a crosswalk, um, and, it, and you notice the, in the, the law it's stated, both marked and unmarked at intersections. And at C, this is a unmarked crosswalk across Main Street as well as across the Minor Street. So there are unmarked crosswalks and there's marked crosswalks. And at C, the drivers are required by law to yield to the pedestrians there, but not everybody understands that. Um, and not that we're requiring or saying that uh, suggesting that we mark every unmarked crosswalk with crosswalks, but those problematic areas where you have people you know, a lot number of people trying to cross there, and you maybe have some crashes and some complaints, maybe starting with marked crosswalks, and that's what we're going to get into. But before we go there, um, I've got a diagram here with uh, a mid-block crossing. Um, you know, pedestrians only have to look at traffic uh, in one direction and then in another direction. So we've got a diagram here with four lanes so with a two-way left turn lane. A pedestrian is wanting to cross from the south side to the north side. Uh, we've got some cars coming from the left, a uh, car and a tank uh, coming from the right. And so therefore, you only have to look left and right to cross mid-block. 
However, at an intersection, and this is sometimes people say, yeah, you should go to an intersection. Uh, they think it's more safe or safer, but you got the left turners and then, or you got the people coming from the left and you got people coming from the right. Okay. This is a four legged intersection. Uh, once again, two lanes in each direction with the two way left turn lane. But now you have to think about the left turners uh, and the right turners. So there's more conflict points uh, at a four legged intersection and makes it more complicated. Uh, it could be for a pedestrian. So therefore, people may subconsciously or even consciously cross at mid block because of these conflict points and the more challenges there are with this. So a little background uh, with regards to uh, the step and how this all developed because there was a landmark study back in 2005. It's called the safety effects of marked versus unmarked crosswalks at uncontrolled uh, locations. Uh, this particular study uh, looked at 2,000 different locations, 1,000 marked and 1,000 unmarked uh, for comparison uh, sites. All of the locations were at uncontrolled locations. Once again, that means that they're not signalized, there's no stop signs, and all of the locations were at 40 miles per hour or less. The results of this study basically concluded that on two-lane roads, if all you did was a marked crosswalk, there was really no significant difference in the crash rate. However, on multi-lane roads, of three or more lanes, if it was under 12,000 ADT, if all you did was a marked crosswalk, really no significant difference in the crash rate. If it was over 12,000 ADT, average daily traffic, uh, with no median, or over 15,000 ADT, even with the median, if all you did was a marked crosswalk, you can actually expect to see more crashes at that location than if you didn't mark it at all. So it's like, wow, okay. So this was that land, you know, major uh, revelation here. You could actually be making it you know, worse for pedestrians by put, just putting a marked crosswalk out there in these certain situations. Okay, so does that mean, oh wow, you know, over 12,000 ADT without a median, over 15,000 even with the median, let's not put any marked crosswalks out there? Some actually engineers concluded that, but that's not what the report, if they read the rest of the report, the recommendation is that you have to do more than just the marked crosswalk at those locations where you got the high ADTs, uh, multiple lanes, uh, and even with or without a median, depending on those numbers. And so that's where we're going to get into. But one of the explanations with regards to why that might be is called a multiple threat situation. Some of you might be familiar with this. This is uh, Capitol Way in Olympia, uh, right side outside my office. I've crossed this road when I was going in the office, um, you know, some time ago, uh, we would cross this road. And this would ha I would see this a lot. Uh, the first, uh, we have a, a picture here where you have a bus uh, at this T inter or at a four legged intersection, and the bus is stopped for pedestrians to cross. Uh, there's a car uh, on the inside lane, um, and they probably cannot see the pedestrian crossing. They might think that the bus is just stopped to let people off and on, uh, but that vehicle on the inside lane may not recognize that uh, people are crossing, and you have this multiple threat situation. Okay. We'll talk about some solutions to that. Uh, but speed is a huge problem, um, and as, especially for pedestrians, for all modes, but especially for pedestrians. On the screen here, we have at 20 miles per hour, if a pedestrian is hit, 18% chance that they're not gonna survive. Uh, and that is gonna, you know, 18% chance that it'll be a fatality or a serious injury. So pretty low at 20 miles per hour. At 30 miles per hour, it increases to 50%. And at 40 miles per hour, it increases to 77%. 77% chance at 40 miles per hour that they're not going to survive. It's going to be a fatal or a serious injury. In addition, there's a, a diagram at the below which shows the perspective of the driver. At 20 miles per hour, they're able to really focus uh, and see the entire uh, cone of what we call the cone of vision. So throughout the maybe the entire windshield. While the faster that they're going, their cone of vision uh, it reduces because uh, they're looking further downstream. Uh, so the peripheral, it's uh, more hazy. They may not be able to detect pedestrians and other things that are going on in the peripherals as uh, the, the higher speeds that they're, the faster that they're going. So you see some different numbers, uh, some tables with this uh, around the country. This is becoming very, it's a very good education uh, awareness uh, with regards to speed and the survivability of pedestrians and the effect also on drivers, just that ability. So 
in 2005, going back to the Zagir study, um, we, there was a table in there that actually had uh, the, in the rows, it had the number of lanes uh, on the top. It had the ADTs and then various speeds. Uh, and then it, where the, the rows and the columns um, lined up, there was boxes. And they had different uh, initials, C, P, and N, which stood for whether it was a good candidate or whether it wasn't a good candidate, um, potential candidate, and so forth but it didn't list any treatments. And that's where in EDC4, uh, we took in 2018, when we first started this STEP initiative, we developed this guide for improving pedestrian safety at uncontrolled crossing locations. So we took that Zagir study and we improved upon it and we gave what the, a lot of agencies were looking for, which is uh, you know, some recommendations for different types of treatments. Uh, and this is based upon uh, research. And so we've come a long ways in this area and I'll go more into table one here shortly. But the guide is uh, it's guidance for suggesting how to select countermeasures as well as other uh, improving policies and uh, sort of helping to develop a, a program. Um, in the guide, uh, it shows a, a six step process. Uh, first one is collecting data and engaging the public. Step two would be inventory conditions and prioritize locations. Step three, analyze crash types and safety issues. Uh, step four is selecting the countermeasures, which is the one that I'm gonna be focusing on today with Larry. And then step five, consult design and installation resources. And step six, identifying opportunities and monitoring outcomes. Uh, we will provide you the, I suspect the handout here with the, the links, uh, or you can go to the EDC STEP website and download this guide. Uh, recommend that you would take a look at this. It's a, a great document. Uh, once again, it is for uncontrolled crossing locations only though. Okay. So let's, uh, we're gonna like, as I mentioned, uh, focus in on selecting countermeasures, which is step four. And I'm gonna be more focused on table one, which is really with regards to the roadway features. Being an engineer, that's sort of what I got to choose uh, based upon the fact that uh, I only had an hour to do this. Uh, so that covers ADT or AADT, average, uh, annual average uh, daily traffic, number of lanes, the medium presence, and then the speed limit. There is a table two uh, in the guide as well, which really deals more with uh, selecting countermeasures based upon the safety issues, such as conflicts of crossings, excessive speed, visibility issues, or other types of safety issues. Okay. So one of the best things that came out of this guide, as I mentioned, and this is that tool uh, when Barb gave the description of the workshop, this is that tool that uh, can be used very quickly. Um, it is the table one uh, of, the, of the guide. And once again, on the left column, we have roadway configuration, which uh, has two lanes, three lanes with raised median, three lanes without raised median, four plus lanes with raised median, and then four plus lanes without a raised median. And across the top, uh, we have a posted speed limit and AADT. Uh, there's three columns for AADT, which uh, shows less than 9,000, and then we have a range between 9,000 and 15,000, and then we have greater than 15,000. And in those ADT categories, there's three columns as well, which shows less than or equal to 30 miles per hour, 35 miles per hour, or greater or equal to 40 miles per hour. So each of those ADTs has those categories. So we have a bunch of boxes uh, that are developed. And in those boxes, uh, we have various numbers in there. Uh, the numbers one through nine. The numbers uh, signify that the countermeasure is a candidate treatment at a marked and controlled crossing location. And number one represents high visibility crosswalk markings, parking restrictions on crosswalk approach, adequate nighttime lighting levels and crossing warning signs. Okay, that's number one. If you see that, those is what it's covering. Number two is a raised crosswalk. Number three is advance yield here or stop here for pedestrian sign and stop line. Well, I'm, and I'm gonna cover each of these in more detail uh, as we go through. Step four, or item number four is the in-street pedestrian crossing sign. Number five is the curb extension. Okay. And then number six is pedestrian refuge island. Seven is the rectangular rapid flashing beacon, also known as the RFB. And then there's the road diet is number eight. And number nine is the pedestrian hybrid beacon, also known as PHB. 
Uh, now, some of the uh, numbers are circled with a dark circle, and that signifies that the countermeasure should always be considered, but not mandated or required based upon engineering judgment at a marked uncontrolled crossing location. And then some of them are not in a dark circle, just a regular circle, and those signify that the crosswalk visibility enhancements should always occur in conjunction with other identified countermeasures. Okay. So that is the table, and really based upon what your roadway configuration is, it can, it, once again, it's just guidance, but it helps you decide what type of countermeasures you might want to put in uh, to your crossing. With that, let's get into the Spectacular 7 here. And uh, I've just got the, some different icons laid out in the number seven. Uh, we are in the day of Marvel Comics. I know uh, Marvel Universe hasn't put out anything recently, but uh, I like to think of these as superheroes. Uh, and even the RFB, as I mentioned, it, it sort of died like all superheroes, and then it comes back to life, uh, continuing the mission. But let's start out with number one here, the crosswalk visibility enhancements. Uh, we also do have text sheets on our website, which uh, you see the front page here. It shows the crash reduction factor. Uh, so if you're ap applying these, these are some uh, based upon different research and applications what different agencies have seen with regards to a reduction um, as far as crashes uh, when you apply these treatments. They are specific. Do you, you do want to look at the context of what they were applied to see if you're with the right numbers, the values that you'll get. But these text sheets are great. Nice little summary. There's, a, uh, there's some images that help depict whether, uh, you know, what the application looks like. And on the back, it does talk about some costs and other good information. So with the crosswalk visibility enhancements, once again, 23 to 48 percent crash reduction factor. Um, and these can be used in combination. We Here we have a, a blow up of one of the diagrams here. You can see we, uh, there's a... Um, Two lane, there's one lane in each direction roadway, a two lane road and with some parking. And then we have a mid block curb extension with high visibility uh, ladder style crosswalk. We've got the W112 sign, pedestrian sign, as well as the in street Mom sign. Which took we'll, it this morning, an ink pen? Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah, which we'll go into. And then you also see lighting. So a lot of these treatments, they can actually be used together. Okay. So we'll start out with the uh, um, crosswalk visibility. Uh, you know, the minimum in the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, which I'll refer to as the MUTCD, requires that you only have to have two transverse lines or two parallel lines. And so crosswalks are for pedestrians, but they're also for drivers as well, which we'll see here that, that to the minimum, uh, it, you can't see that from the pedestrian or from the driver's viewpoint. So Larry, here we've got uh, just the two lateral lines. Uh, it's got some shady uh, you know, um, images, or it's got some uh, shade uh, from the trees that's coming down onto the roadway. And then we've got uh, a picture on the upper right-hand corner with the uh, Continental, which is staggered, and it's staggered so that the wheel pass can go through, and uh, so it'll last longer for maintenance purposes. Um, but the pedestrians can see those, uh, but the drivers uh, much better with regards to the images down below um, where you're seeing it from the driver's viewpoint and they can see the high visibly marked crosswalks uh, from further back. Just to, um, I'd ask, like to ask you with regards to the minimum versus the higher visibility, uh, what you, you know, your, your thoughts on those? I think the more visibility uh, for the pedestrian to be seen or for the person who is driving a vehicle in advance of approaching that crossing, um, the more awareness, the better it is. The, the challenge we have um, is that um, people I have rode with and actually for a uh, few years I actually drive, we become accustomed to our roots. Um, and when we become accustomed to our roots, there are daily norms. And when you have an intersection such as that, that is not normally having a lot of pedestrian activity on it, you become complacent. And so I think that what you have to do for a, 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 in a person who's using mobility devices is uh, in that environment, you have to be conscientious of your route and you have to be aware that there may be some line of sight issues um, for you as well as for the person who's driving a vehicle, which requires extra sense of uh, caution and proceeding, but it also is a good area to where the marked area again, could be with some tactile guidance or some other type of information uh, that could be passed on to the non-vision 
uh, non-visual user uh, to go from point A to point B. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's uh, great and great point. Uh, and so, but the one other thing though is that someone with low vision, I would think that the higher, um, high visibly marked crosswalks, the continental style would be much uh, easier to detect. Oh, absolutely. Well. And absolutely. That visibility for both the pedestrian and for the, uh, and yes, absolutely. Um, low vision people, um, and, and, and it, uh, ha, uh, the, the reality is, is that contrast is a big issue for folks who are low vision. Um, who, who need that contrast. And so the more contrast uh, distinction between the road surface and the guides um, are a huge issue. That's why in fact, why white typically across asphalt becomes a preferred option for cross rock guidance. And the thicker the lining uh, for a person on either the uh, left or the right side for crossing presents the guide crossing that a person would use to get from one intersection side to the other side. Great. Thank you. All right. So we're going from markings, uh, sort of the, we're going to be working our way up and then we're getting into some signs. And this particular image, we see the R1-6 uh, sign. Uh, you would use the R1-6A, which would be state law stop for pedestrian rather than the R1-6, which say state law yield to pedestrian, just because uh, different states have different laws. Uh, in the image, you see that it's on a, uh, a narrow median, uh, raised median. Uh, and so these are used at the crosswalks. It's great with regards to reminding drivers that it is the law because they're, and I, you know, depending on what part of the state you're in or in many parts for me, when I travel across the country, you know, we've got different driver behaviors, but not everybody knows the laws or maybe they don't adhere to it. So it's a great reminder. Um, great to do these with the law enforcement type of campaigns uh, with regards to crosswalk enforcement. Uh, but these are great. They're about 150 to $200 a piece. Uh, now these are not on, you know, to be put out on a 45 mile per hour roadway. These are more for the lower speed roadways. Uh, and uh, they are mounted into the roadway and they should be uh, when they if they do get hit and they will get hit sometimes uh, they should bounce back so you don't want them to be missiles uh, when they get hit do, uh, do, do you have to think about with regards to the placement with regards to turning vehicles and so forth but these can be put on median lines uh, the raised medians or the yellow center line or on the uh, edge line uh, but there, in the MUTCD, it uh, does have specific details as to where the placements uh, can go. That multi-threat situation that we talked about earlier, here we have a diagram, a, a sort of a bird's uh, eye view of a car, that, uh, car A, which is stopped right at the crosswalk, and then car B, which is further behind, but they can't see the pedestrian that car A has stopped for that is crossing. And so a low cost treatment that can really help this is just pulling that, putting a stop bar back about 30 uh, feet. Uh, in the MUTCD, it says 20 to 50 feet is, uh, you can do that distance. Some people do it based upon the, the, speed of the speed limit of the roadway. But just pulling that stop bar back uh, about maybe 30 feet opens up that sight triangle for the pedestrian and uh, the car in the inside lane. Uh, so car A stops, uh, the car uh, B, even if they do blow by car A, will now give opportunity for the pedestrian to jump back. And so uh, really low cost treatment to help with regards to that multi-threat situation. Uh, yeah, Larry, did you want to say, add something to that? Uh, yeah, the, the average pedestrian can jump back, but a person in a motorized wheelchair or a motor, non-motorized uh, chair or a blind person uh, probably does not have a good as chance as jumping back. And I just, uh, I, I, I see this actually occurring uh, here in Olympia up near Ralph's Thriftway on State Street, which is a one-way street in, uh, at State and Fairview. And there, people will stop on one line. It's a 25 mile an hour zone, but the road is actually allows most people drive 30 to 35 miles an hour uh, and you're playing roulette. And so that concept that 30 feet back gives a, pedestrian, a car time to react or to give a pedestrian time to react. That's not a reality for persons who are using any type of device or who have no sight. Just, just want to point that out. And, that, and I think that that's where it leads to, we need to become more cultured about the pedestrian uh, movement as we have less and less people who by choice or by income are unable to drive in an urban area 
and you know we we need to work on changing that cultural behavior even regardless of how much safety devices are put into place uh, for setback for stop lines etc and I, I just add that into the conversation no great thank you and that's uh, I, I told I when I said I was going to learn something from this uh, that's a great point and so that probably pulling that stop bar back you know to the 50 feet might actually be a really great idea or and then some other things that we'll talk about maybe some additional and, um, and the only challenge you have with that is let's say that vehicle one is a is a silent car um, you know like some of the Toyotas and some of the new uh, 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 non-motorized vehicles without a noise on that vehicle, stopping a vehicle back 50 feet poses yet another challenge um, to low vision and no vision individuals. And so, had, so it, it, this is a challenge here uh, because you, you understand even low vision folks who can see that marking on a crossing may not see the distance of 50 feet um, because of their visual acuity um, in, in that respect. And so if you, let's assume that you have two vehicles of approaching that happen to be electric vehicles. Um, that's like a silent movie. Oh, great. Barb, did you want to jump in here? Oh, you're on mute. Or I can't, for some reason, you might have a different, we can't hear you. You may not be on mute, but we just can't hear you. Yeah, no, I'm muted in okay. two places. So um, just doing a quick time check, we have about a half hour left to finish slides and address questions. Um, if folks can, you know, make a note to yourself of your question and type it in when we get to the end, we'll do as many as we can. But I just wanted to note that. And also to Larry's point about quiet cars, another factor that did come up in questions is noting the, the requirement for a pedestrian to actually step into the street to cue the driver that they intend to cross places that burden on a pedestrian who can't and especially if it's Larry, Larry can't tell whether the driver sees him or not. And so I don't know that that um, factors into the choice of countermeasures, but just as an additional thing, you might, one of you might be able to speak to. Um, is, that a, is that a case where the statute itself has an implicit bias that doesn't factor in disability? Great point. And it could, and it, can it, could it does, because there's another factor to the low, low and no vision. Um, the low and no vision and those who are hard of hearing. Um, deaf and or hard of hearing because you have a combination of um, you'll hear the term deaf and blind um, and that could mean anywhere from low vision to no vision um, yeah. hearing to no hearing okay. great great discussion uh, I, su I suspect we'll have more of it here near the end um, we'll get through the slides and then uh, we'll yeah I think I appreciate the, that input though Larry um, with that marking, the advanced uh, pullback, uh, advanced uh, stop bar or yield bar, you'll use the appropriate signing. You can see here with the yield here to pedestrian or stop here to pedestrian signs, the R15s. Uh, um, and so that will, it is required to put those with the stop bar or the yield charts teeth yield bar if you're using those. Uh, Next, we're going to go into curb extensions. Anywhere you have parking, uh, here we have uh, in, front end uh, angle parking on the left uh, and then parallel parking on the right and then bike lanes and then two lane road. And uh, it has um, with a curb extension, it's only 32 feet. While if you didn't have the curb extension, it would be about 58 feet wide. And so uh, if you put these in a series, uh, it can actually uh, do some traffic calming. Uh, if you go down a corridor, uh, does also the curb extensions helps with regards to pedestrians and motorists being able to see each other better. The other thing um, along a similar uh, concept is with regards to the curb radii. Uh, we have an image here with a, a, at an intersection where a truck is stopped at the intersection, but there's enough of a gap and a really large radius uh, in, at the corner, and the truck behind them is going to probably be making that maybe a high-speed turn uh, to be able to make that right turn. They're looking to the left, looking for a gap, and they may not see the pedestrian uh, in a wheelchair uh, trying to cross the road uh, at the other, um, on the far side uh, of them. And so large radii really encourages a, a higher speed turn. So we really do encourage that you don't do a cookie cutter design. We do realize that you have to accommodate trucks when you're doing design, but you know, to try to keep those uh, curb radii as tight as possible. Here's an image, a diagram with regards to 
some large radii and some tight radii. And it also does throw the crosswalks. Uh, you know, where are you going to put the crosswalks and the curb ramps? It throws things off a little bit. Um, you can see also the different lengths uh, on the left, 79 feet. Uh, with the tight radii, at 74 feet. Um, with the uh, tight radii to a really large radii, it's 88 feet. And then with the two at the south side, there's 106 feet to cross. So the lengths are a lot larger um, depending on where you put those curb ramps. And so more exposure time for the pedestrian. So not doing cookie cutter design if you can keep them tight. Uh, you also should look at the location and see if you have parking and bike lanes because you have the actual radii or radius, uh, but you also have an effective radius. Now here in this diagram, we see uh, the south uh, east uh, corner of an intersection and it's got a tight radii, maybe about 30 feet, but the effective radius may be closer to maybe 45 to 50 feet because the, the parking and the bike lanes allow uh, a, a bigger radii. So you have the actual and the effective. In, in this image, we see a bus and a logging truck, which are making those turns. Uh, we've got parking there, but you can see that they're making these turns uh, with um, no problem. They're not jumping up on the, uh, the corner of that curb. Uh, so even with the tight radii under the right conditions, uh, it makes those slow speed uh, turns for vehicles. There is a situation with the dedicated right turn pockets. Um, we've got a pork chop island here. We've got a, we had a really um, wide lane for trucks to be able to move. And so when trucks aren't making those movements, you can actually have vehicles making a high speed right turn. And that's not good for pedestrians. And so what we've got is a, a Similar to a truck apron on a roundabout, we've put a truck apron around the corner uh, around this, uh, in this uh, dedicated right turn lane. And it's a different color, different texture. The crosswalk does go all the way to the sidewalk. Um, so you don't wanna make it look like a curb extension. The truncated domes are at the, uh, cross, at the sidewalk. Uh, and so it just really helps with regards to vehicles slowing down, making that turn, but allows the trucks to still go ahead and uh, not mount up on the sidewalk when making it. Lighting is another, um, you know, great uh, in, you know, about over 50% uh, nationwide, uh, a lot of pedestrians are getting uh, killed um, in low lighting situations or no lighting or dark situations. And so putting lighting in can have a crash reduction factor of 42 to 59% um, at intersections. Um, and so we do encourage it. I'm not going to get into a lot of the lighting because uh, it, we definitely encourage you to talk with your DOT or your lighting experts. Um, but the one thing that Federal Highways, they put out a report, a lighting report, um, and they found that instead of putting the lighting directly over the crosswalk, which creates more of a silhouette effect for the pedestrian, to put the lighting in front of the crosswalks and it lights up the pedestrian much better. So not over or behind, but rather in front uh, is the recommendation for uh, crosswalk. With that, we'll go into that. So all of those treatments were under crosswalk visibility enhancements. Uh, next, we'll get into uh, the raised crosswalks. Uh, we've got the tech sheet here, which shows a 45% crash reduction factor. Um, and uh, raised crosswalks really very simply, uh, you know, it's a traffic calming device. Um, typically on two lane or three lane roads, speed limits of 35 miles per hour or less, and then ADTs below 9,000 is sort of the ideal uh, situations where you would go ahead and put in a raised crosswalk. Larry, did you have a comment? I didn't know if you wanted to make a statement. No, I'm fine. Go ahead. Oh, okay. um, I will just simply say, um, and with that lighting being in front of the crossing, the crosswalk uh, that's marked, you, you have reflected device in there. It really makes a big, huge level. So when you bring down that crossing, if you had reflective material in there that uh, that reacts to the light above, that really helps a low vision person at night. Ah, great point. Yes, the retroreflectivity, and that's where the continental or the higher um, high visibility mark crosswalks reflecting the light can help not only the driver, but to someone who is uh, low vision. So great point. Thank you. Um, and with the mark, obviously in the METCD, in a, it's like just like a speed bump, but this is a, a race crosswalk. You have the proper markings. Uh, those marking types are in the METCD. Now, when you put something in, there are considerations that you need to think about. Uh, drainage is one of them, but also talking with your emergency service uh, as well as your maintenance. Uh, they're usually the ones that might, uh, you know, 
put a little kibosh on uh, maybe getting some of these in. But you, if you talk to them, you explain it, um, you know, why you're doing it, uh, you know, you can make it better for all, uh, you know, multimodal roads um, for, you can make it better for pedestrians along those particular routes. The image uh, here that we see is from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, it's out of the resource uh, traffic uh, calming e-primer, which has a lot of different types of traffic calming devices. Um, but it is a, uh, a sidewalk and going, and then in the extension of that sidewalk across a minor road with a raised crosswalk. Uh, it's got high visibility and markings. Could you shut my door? And it also has the truncated domes at the sidewalk. So you still need the truncated domes, but it's basically an extension of that sidewalk across that uh, intersection. And Cambridge, Massachusetts is where that's from, and they've got a policy where they're doing a lot of these. Next, uh, pedestrian refuge islands, an oldie but a goodie. Uh, you know, once again, you can get out to the, you can look at traffic in one direction, get out to the middle, have a little bit of a refuge. Instead of standing on the, you know, double yellow line, uh, you have a little more space, a little more comfort, and then you can look for gaps in the traffic in the other direction. Pedestrian refuge islands um, give you opportunity to also use other types of uh, treatments, like the signings. Uh, here we've got the lighting. This is a one lane in each direction with a two-way left turn lane where we've got a median in that two-way left turn lane, a raised median. So um, some of the things that we see though, uh, just um, with regards to the design of these, um, if the median is less than six feet wide, really it's not a location where somebody would really wanna be waiting out there um, looking for a gap, uh, but you don't put truncated domes out there. Um, I've got an image of here with a, a cut through, um, it's less than six feet. There's no truncated domes. Uh, here is a actual picture of some roadways uh, from Street View where on the top of the image, you can see that it's less than six feet wide. So they did, they did it right by not putting truncated domes in. In the lower picture with the checkered flag um, crosswalk, you see that uh, they've got truncated domes in that narrow median. And what that's telling uh, you know, someone like Larry is say, hey, you finished your crossing because they've gone from the sidewalk uh, to that median detected it and finished, thought that they finished their crossing, but yet they still have four more lanes to cross. Uh, so you would not put truncated domes in that situation. If you have six feet to 16 feet uh, median, then you would go ahead and put the truncated domes in because you do need a, a two foot gap in between so that they know that the, there is a break and they can go and wait out there. Uh, so if, and this is when you're doing the cut through median islands. Uh, here is uh, a couple example, an example up on top though, we do like to have the angled uh, cut throughs because it does leave more length for vehicles uh, or for bicyclists and storage, but yet um, it also forces pedestrians to look to uh, oncoming traffic, sort of forces them that way. However, in the upper image, they did not realign the, the last couple feet to line up with the uh, crosswalk. And so therefore, someone um, who is caning would go out into traffic rather than, or maybe a lot harder for them to line up with the crosswalk and maybe walk into traffic instead of uh, finding the other truncated domes on the other side. Also, the truncated domes need to go the entire width of the, uh, of the opening, not just a portion of it. Um, and the image on the lower uh, picture shows uh, the way that it's properly done, where they've got probably about three feet uh, of uh, edge and it's lined up with the crosswalk. Larry, I don't know if you've had some experience with, with these type of situations or if you wanted to make any comments with regards to this. I have, um, and I have a tendency to, when I do discover them, to find an alternative route, unless it is an intersection that is controlled um, with signals um, in the center of that island. And so I have a tendency to find a different route, which I think fundamentally um, at the end of the day with some of these challenges and some of these decisions without good community and input and really knowing how many pedestrians are really using it, these can be prevented and be better solved through community input and engagement of the ADA community. Uh, in that respect. And so I think in more modern times, uh, as we're looking at these and developing them, um, uh, that input is critical so that we can make good decisions about how that should be done. I kind of come from the school that if you're going to have to go to the island and the traffic is moving at 40 miles an hour, or 35 miles an hour, 
there's an additional expense to it, but is that more appropriate for a pedestrian overpass um, if, 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 if it would be allowed and there's an additional expense there. So that's how I cope with those. That's how I um, hear from some of my colleagues in the ADA community cope with it as we find a different route. Or in that instance, we're forced into using custom bus service or transit um, uh, infrastructure to navigate that area. So They're great scary. Point. Yeah. So really do, you know, talking with, uh, you know, the, the users and uh, I think that outreach, uh, very important key point. So um, I think, and we'll probably do more of this because uh, you made some good points there and maybe doing the proper design, how to design these that work well for you, whether the angles and, and other things. So um, the other aspect of this is the landscaping. Um, for, unfortunately, we're doing this uh, virtually, uh, but uh, fortunately for me, you can't see how uh, vertically challenged I am. And so when you do landscaping, uh, you do want to keep it uh, to ground cover so that you're not blocking pedestrians uh, waiting in the median. Um, so you, you can put them out there, but uh, you know, using colorful native plants, uh, helpful, but just don't block the sight of the pedestrians that you're trying to. Um, now I'll have a comment. To the thing about the vegetation being there, even if it's low profile, let's just say that it grows to six inches or less, they grow wider. Maintenance becomes a huge, huge issue with that debris moving into those islands. And I have been in that situation. Okay. Great point. Yeah, maintenance is always something that, that we, we do bring up. All right, um, just doing a time check. Uh, we've got to get through these. So uh, I'm going to, in all of this, uh, the information is out on our website, but the RFB, the Rectangular Rapid Flashing Beacon, 47% uh, crash reduction factor. It's under uh, interim approval 21 rather than he died and it's come back to life and there have been a couple of those. But do note that these are just a pedestrian actuated conspicuity enhancement. It's letting p drivers know that a pedestrian is wanting to cross at this location. These are used for pedestrian signs, school or crossing, trail crossing warning signs. Uh, whether you use the diagonal arrow placard or if you've got an advance ahead placard you can use at those locations but these are specifically um, only allowed for these uh, applications if you need because of sight distance um, you can uh, you know use additional so you, sometimes you have a pedestrian ahead sign you can put the rfb on those signs as well so you can have multiple um two three you know, like you have three uh, rfb signs going on at the same time okay the new flash pattern in uh, 21 shows that uh, it goes back and forth. Uh, we've got an image here, it's flashing back and forth, and then it does uh, a flash twice, the same beacon twice. So it goes in between the pedestrian sign and the placard. Uh, these really are great. Uh, people love them because it really does draw the attention of the, uh, the drivers, letting them know pedestrians are um, wanting to cross. And uh, instead of the old 24 seven old beacons that are constantly on, we don't want to put beacons on 24 seven. People just, uh, you know, lose, forget about them because they're on all the time. Uh, they don't pay attention. Uh, on the RFB, they are supposed to be on both sides of the roadway. In this particular image, we have a median. So they have one on the uh, far right side and then the median, and then one facing the other direction, um, uh, approaching direction on the far left. Uh, however, you can go three, but uh, you only need two. Um, research has shown that if you put three, it's not that much of an increase with regards to the effectiveness. But these are solar. Uh, and uh, these are, and that's one of the ways that uh, it helps bring down the cost, uh, but you can hardwire them as well. But once again, the key point here is that you have to have them on both sides of the roadway. Uh, the other great thing about this is that uh, as soon as a pedestrian activates it, uh, the uh, flash period comes on immediately. Uh, and so drivers are aware that a pedestrian wants to cross. Uh, that's important because when a pedestrian hits, uh, uh, activates uh, the, the button, if it doesn't come on, it, they can think it's either broken. Uh, if there's cars that, uh, you know, are, there are no cars and they're going to cross anyways. And so you don't get that compliance uh, as well. So once again, there is a, a proper application of these. But uh, one of the great things is that, um, you know, you push it and it's activated. Uh, the 
pedestrian may not necessarily see based upon the angle, uh, the rectangular rapid flash beacons flashing. So there is, uh, you can put a small pilot lights that can be installed on the side to let the pedestrian know that they're actuated. I think now, there's an important point to make here though. Um, a best practice in the state of Washington is we're leading folks to putting in locator beacons. And those are different than APS. And locator beacon only tells the person who's going to activate it where the push button is to activate those flashing lights. It does not tell them if the lights are flashing or not. It just simply allows them to know where that button is so that they can activate it so that they can then cross. Right. And so with the RFB, it does say lights are flashing. It doesn't tell them when they can cross like a pedestrian uh, signal. Uh, it just says yellow lights are flashing. And I see Barb on the screen. Um, yep. I'm just doing my monitor job of one more time check. If we can try to wrap in about five minutes, we've got some great questions and I know people will immediately start dropping more in as soon as you finish the slide. So okay. um, we could have gone on this for two hours. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry about that. The great discussion though. I'm learning a lot too, but okay. So that's the RFB, but then um, at some level, you know, RFBs uh, greater than 40 miles per hour, really uh, hesitant to do that, uh, although it, it's allowed, some states are doing it, but you want to go to the next level, which is the pedestrian hybrid beacon. These are, um, and the text sheet shows a 55% crash reduction factor, uh, but these are great. And let me just go to the image here with regards to the street view where you got the PHB uh, actuated with pedestrians going across. You've got, uh, if it's not activated, it's in a blank. And we call it a beacon because if it's a signal, people have to stop. But in the blank situation with the beacon, people don't. And typically across the country, we haven't had an issue with that. When it's activated, it goes to a flashing yellow, and then it goes to a steady yellow, letting the drivers know that they're going to have to stop. Uh, the pedestrian head shows a uh, hand, a don't walk hand uh, that showed up. And in stage uh, phase four, where it's the steady red, because you've got two balls. So let me just describe the configuration. You got two uh, red balls up on top and a yellow ball. Uh, in between those two. So it's three uh, heads. When it's the solid red in phase four, that's when the pedestrian gets the walk signal. Okay. And that's when the pedestrian can walk halfway uh, across the roadway. That's the way it's signaled. Uh, the timing can be signaled. And then it goes into a wigwag. In the wigwag phase, you can do the clearance interval where you do the countdown. This is where if the pedestrian has cleared the, the driver's side of the roadway, the driver can then go ahead and proceed. Um, in a signal, you would have to wait for the pedestrian to clear the entire roadway. So this is a great application where you're, you know, a lot of engineers are trying to balance between pedestrian safety as well as traffic progression. And so that wigwag phase helps with regards to vehicles stop and then proceed. And then once that's done, it goes back to a blank uh, signal, starts all over again until it's activated again. These are really designed for pedestrians uh, to be able to cross high-speed multi-lane roadways because uh, where engineers wanted to put in a signal uh, because there wasn't the traffic volume or pedestrian volumes for a signal, they couldn't put in a signal. And so Richard Nassi in Tucson, Arizona developed uh, the pedestrian hybrid beacon to help in these situations. There is a table in the MUTCD with regards to on the y-axis, the a number of pedestrians per hour from zero to 500, and then the, uh, the vehicles on the x-axis, uh, vehicles per hour from zero to 2000. And then there's some, um, the lines with regards to uh, where you might be able to detect, uh, where you might put in a PHB. But the minimum number that they have here is 20, while versus a signal requires 93 pedestrians per hour for a signal to be uh, warranted. Now, these are not warrants for the PHB. They're just guidelines. And so 20, uh, and even if you don't meet that 20, you can do an engineering justification to say, if we put this in, we're going to get those 20. So just be aware of that. It is easier to get a PHB in. It helps them to get across the roadway. There is a sign that needs to go on the, um, with the, the, the PHB, which is says crosswalk stop on red. Not everybody understands that they can proceed though with regards to the flashing red. And so there is another sign that says crosswalk stop on red, proceed on flashing red when clear. So that is an optional sign to help drivers to let them know that they can stop and then clear when the pedestrians are not there. All right, next, road diets or road buffets. Uh, depending on what you want to call it, uh, not everyone likes diet. So uh, someone told me the term road buffets, you get more choices. But the classic road diet is from four to three lanes. Um, 
tech sheet shows 19 to 47% crash reduction factor. But, uh, you know, when you can't get a PHB in, but if you don't have the number of tra the traffic, why don't you do a lane diet? You can get bike lanes. It really reuses that roadway from curb to curb for better purposes versus moving just traffic, high, uh, traffic at peak hours. And so here on this image, you got four lanes in each direction. And then in the bottom image, we have one lane in each direction with a two-way left turn. And then you have opportunities to put in medians. Um, you know, you can do curb... Uh, uh, you know, if you had parking, if it was wide enough, you could do curb extensions and so forth. Here we have uh, bike shoulders, uh, and then you can do the additional siding and lighting that we talked about. So it's a great application uh, for complete streets as well. But you do need to have the right numbers, and we'll go into that here in a second. Uh, here's an image with regards to an actual, with the parking, bike lanes, uh, the refuge island, uh, one lane in each direction. Just, it, it helps with the top speeders as well, but it reduces that multi-threat situation. The one thing that I'll point out here uh, in this image with the two images before and after is the pavement. We had uh, four lanes in each direction, but now we have one lane in each direction with a turn lane uh, and then uh, back and angle parking on the left and parallel parking on the right. Um, but uh, we, the, the, the new pavement is the, the key thing that I wanted to point out here because if you stay a year or two ahead of your resurfacing projects, you can actually do this fairly cheaply. Uh, these are some numbers so we show with regards to candidates and what type of maybe um, analysis that you might do. Less than 10,000 ADT, really hardly any traffic impact. Uh, great candidate. Between 10 to 15,000 ADT, really a very good candidate. You might need to do an intersection analysis. 15 to 20,000 ADT is a good candidate, uh, but more of a corridor analysis. And then greater than 20,000 um, would be a possibly feasibility study. Still can do it. Some agencies even go 26,000 because they're willing to live with a lower level of service for vehicles, but a higher level of service uh, for all modes, uh, other modes. So you can even go that high. Finally, with the LPI, this is the one uh, app treatment that we do at a signalized location. Um, and it's a very simple concept. If you've got all your pedestrian heads and your APS signals and everything, very low cost because you just have your signal guy go out there and change the timing where the pedestrian gets a three to five second head start to establish themselves out in the crosswalk um, before the vehicles get their green. So you can, there's an image here where the signal shows a red ball while the pedestrian signal shows a walk signal in a a uh, person in a wheelchair that is uh, getting out there and establishing themselves in the crosswalk, starting that crossing. So it can be a very low cost treatment, but if you don't have APS that can add to the cost, you need to have the APS because we can't discriminate against the um, disabled community. And so therefore making sure that you put APS in there to let them know when they can start their crossing. And with that, um, I will go, that's sort of the end. This is uh, your website, which shows uh, all the different resources available to you. And uh, with that, this is our contact information and I will leave it to you. <laughs> Thank you, Barb. Sorry, I went a little over. Lots of great content. Um, and thanks to folks. I know you were holding questions. So I know now a big burst will come in and we won't get to them all. And I would say our commitment is to schedule future sessions where we unpack more of this. There are a couple of, of interesting points about the countermeasure grouping by the miles per hour when we've got, uh, you know, fewer fatalities and serious injuries at a lower rate. Why do you have a cut point at 30 instead of, say, 25 or 20? And in other words, start imposing more countermeasures at 25, not at 30 and above. And Peter, if you might, if you happen to know the logic behind that table, and then I've got one more I wanna make sure we get to, yeah, and there are others point. coming in. Yeah, so great uh, point. Um, the researchers, uh, based upon the research, Charlie Zagir, uh, they're the ones that sort of did those break points, but yeah, 30 miles per hour or less. Um, it's, I, I think based upon all the research and the, the number of maybe cases, but I, I, yeah, that's probably the best I I can get to you. Uh, we, maybe we may be able to talk with Charlie Zagir more on that later, but it does cover. Okay. So they're just saying that they would like to see 25 and below, um, maybe a different range, huh? I, I know that Seattle. Yeah, if we're looking at, go ahead, Larry. Larry. I know that, I know that Seattle has made a business decision of 25 miles per hour um, and I know that the that met with very much satisfaction from the ADA community. Barb, if there's additional questions, um, I'm happy to answer those after this workshop is over with. If there's anything that is directed to me, um, if they have my email address, I will answer every question the, after the conference. Yeah, and I can stay Super. longer too. 
but uh, just to let a quick note, that table, table one, it's just guidance. And so agencies have actually taken that and they've put their own values in there as well. So if they're not comfortable with that 30, okay. they're welcome to go down to 25. Okay. Okay. Super. So Peter, a request that you put your, the contact information slide back up. So people have that. And, um, and then I will, I'm going to drop links in as this closes. So if Cascade folks, if you can hold the chat room open, I will drop in a link to our, we have a step plan developed with FHWA support where you find some of the same information and in the context of Washington state law. So I think that would be helpful for our Washington participants. One really important point um, that was raised, if you could both speak to it, is the, is the idea of co cognitive issues that affect your ability to operate safely in this space. Um, whether you're supervising little kids, if we think about all ages and abilities, um, I know we used to have a colleague at WashDOT whose son has autism, and he said walking somewhere with him and recognizing the sensory input effects on him changed how he operated himself by making for my son to live in, in the future. And so, and there's such a range of cognitive effects for people. I don't know if we are anywhere near addressing that in roadway design, but does either of you, and I might ask Larry first, if, do you know of any work that's really saying how do we make this accessible? Um, more accessible? Yeah, the answer to your question is, is that it, it's a reality. Um, but the unfortunate thing in the 30 years of the Americans with Disability Act, we're still unpacking the, vis the visible and non-visible disabilities that people present um, when accessing programs and services. And, and I think that is a reality that is very much true. I mean, all of us who have had small children uh, experience the fear factor. Imagine a person who has autism or some other types of environments, um, you know, that uh, in their uh, in, in their lives that uh, and so that. So, Barb, I think it's something that we should be having some conversation about. But I have not had to lead any kind of a conversation here in our state, and in my national work, I'm not. It, it's not something that has rise, rose into the surface, um, but, but certainly I, I think we should have those conversations and if people have input, they should contact me because I have, I and you have a great deal of influence on the design process here in the state of Washington. Super. And Peter, do you know of any work at, that FHWA might be digging into on this? They just had the big pedestrian safety summit. They've used the term all ages and abilities. Correct. And that's a great point. And we do have uh, a lot more uh, emphasis in this area. Elizabeth Hilton, uh, Brooks Truvia on my team, the Resource Center, um, they're starting to really look at this from the different ADA um, you know, issues. Uh, and so we are putting more focus on it. I don't know of any research with regard to the cognitive issue, but that is something to bring up. And uh, I would love to, you know, like I said, I'm learning a lot here and I will, I will contact, continue to contact Larry and you and to continue to work uh, this at a national level as well. So I really appreciate, that's okay. why I do appreciate this opportunity. Yeah, there's a huge difference. Super. There's a huge difference about the intersect and cognitive um, persons, cognitive with disabilities, and then uh, sensory disabilities, um, which um, they they intersect and both have similar uh, challenges to um, accommodate um, in general. So um, autism would be more considered a sensory versus a cognitive would be more of an intellectual disability. Just, just kind of want to help that conversation a little bit. Super, thank you for that clarification, I think, Niall learning to use the right words the right way to respect everybody's experience of the transportation system. Um, we got about one more minute and there was a specific technical question about using a hawk signal on a corridor with signals timed for people in cars. And I don't know that that's the right note to end on, but Peter, do you have more information to speak to on that or if somebody follows up with you? Sure. Um, and I do know of an application where with the PHB, if it's a mid-block location, you can synchronize it with your other signals uh, in maybe during peak hours. Dallas, uh, in Dallas, Texas, they actually did this um, mid-block crossing PHB. Um, it helps with the progression with the vehicles, uh, but during off-peak hours, it's a hot response. Uh, so it's activated, it comes on very quickly so pedestrians don't have to wait. But during peak hours, it's synchronized with the rest of the system, but you know, pedestrians aren't gonna cross when vehicles are coming. So there are some different techniques to really balance the safety and the um, progression. It's really complicated because everyone has, you have to think, engineers have to think about so many different uh, users, right? Um, so 
but yeah, there is some techniques yeah. there. Yeah. All right. Well, we, we're going to have to wrap. I appreciate everybody hanging in there. Um, close with a sort of a thought that was somebody's question is about pedestrian actuation in the age of COVID. Nobody wants to touch a button. And so um, thinking ahead to the opportunities of technology as well as the downside and the equity issues of technology, I think is another topic for future discussion. And we just clearly have to have a summit that runs for like four weeks or something. Um, more webinars to come. I am going to drop a couple of links into the chat before we close. Thank people very much for participating. There is a link to the feedback form going in and give your feedback on this session and what kinds of trainings you'd like to have in future on these topics. And come back for the midday uh, talk at 1230. So here come a couple of links and then we'll close the room. Thanks so much, everybody. And thanks again to Peter and Larry for your time. You're up. Thank you all.